Good morning, MetaView. I pray that everyone is doing well. I sure will be glad when the stay-at-home order is over and we can gather together again as a church. I'm looking forward to giving the sermon on Sunday from the pulpit at the church building as opposed to preaching from this corner. Uh, though, quite honestly, being in the corner is not too out of place for me. I, I spent most of my childhood in the corner. But anyway, be that as it may, you've tuned in this morning because you want an encouraging word for the Lord. And we'll get to that encouraging word in just a moment. But before we consider an encouraging word, I want to say something to you that's liable to discourage you. But you know it's true. The way that you feel right now is probably the best that you're going to feel throughout the rest of your life. It's only going to get worse you're only going to develop more aches and pains. And probably this morning when you looked in the mirror, the person you saw looking back at you is probably the most attractive person that you're going to see throughout the rest of your life when you look in the mirror. From here on out, there's only going to be more wrinkles. There's only going to be more gray hair, maybe less hair. We all know that it's true. That's what we're experiencing. Now, if you're, say, under the age of 30, for now, you can disregard what I've said. But if the Lord blesses you with enough life, you're going to realize the truth of it. We wear out in this world. You know, we all have had things in our past that shape the person that we are now. And for we, me, one of the um, most formative events in my life was the death of my dad. He died at age 54. And so, that has really been a motivation to me uh, to try to do what I can to try not to die. <laughs> and so that's been a, a motivation to me to continue to try to exercise a little bit. Um, in earlier years, I loved to run, but I can't run anymore. And the reason I can't run anymore is because of my knees. Uh, I've run enough that my knees have just worn out. And now anytime I try to run, my knees kill me. Just a couple months ago, on a Wednesday night, it started to rain, and so I ran out to get the van for charity to pull it under the awning so that she and John Parker and Carter wouldn't have to get out into the rain. And just running that short distance from the church building to the van, my knees killed me for a couple of weeks. And see, the truth is, as I've tried to keep my body from wearing out, that is running, I've actually worn my body out. There is nothing that we can do in this world to keep from wearing out. That's just what we do. And so what I want to give to us this morning is a word to those who are wearing out, some encouragement for those of us who are wearing out. And I think one of the most helpful passages along this line comes from Paul's pen. It's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 to 18. This really is one of my favorite passages in all of the Bible. Here's what Paul writes. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, on, on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. As we think about this passage from Paul this morning, three points I want to lay on your heart. In the first place, we want to think about Paul's outward wasting. In the second place, we want to think about Paul's inward strengthening. And in the third place, we'll consider Paul's upward looking. So Paul said in verse 16, though outwardly we are wasting away. Now, I have no doubt that Paul understood the truth of what we observed in the introduction. Paul knew that physically he was wearing out because of age. We're introduced to the Apostle Paul when he's a young man, Acts chapter 7 and 8, and we see Paul still writing when he's an old man in the book of Philemon. And so Paul well knew the truth that Solomon eloquently expressed in Ecclesiastes 12, beginning in verse 1. That 
incredibly beautiful, though discouraging, passage about um, wearing out as we age. But when Paul says here in 2 Corinthians 4.16 that outwardly we are wasting away, he's not talking about wasting away as a result of age. He's talking about wasting away as a result of persecution. If we'd begun reading 2 Corinthians from the beginning, we would have seen in verse 10 that Paul said, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus. And Paul there is talking about suffering as a result of persecution. 2 Corinthians is one of my favorite books in the New Testament because it is Paul's most autobiographical book. There are so many incredible truths about Paul's life that we wouldn't know if we didn't have 2 Corinthians. And you know well, I'm sure, that in 2 Corinthians 11, Paul gives uh, the most detailed list of his sufferings. And so if you will, turn with me to 2 Corinthians 11, and let's notice some things that Paul went through that led to what he says in chapter 4, verse 16, his outward wasting away. Now we could begin reading a little bit earlier, but let's start in verse 23 of 2 Corinthians 11. Paul asks concerning these false apostles in Corinth who were casting aspersions on him, and so they forced him to defend his own apostleship. And he does so not by bragging about his spiritual privileges, but by talking about the sufferings that he had endured for the cause of the gospel. And so Paul asks, are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to talk like this. I'm more. I've worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I've spent a night and a day in the deep. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I've labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak, and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin, and I do not inwardly burn? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, who is to be praised forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor under King Aretas had the city of the Damascenes guarded in order to arrest me. But I was lowered in a basket from a window, in a wall, and slipped through their hands. Now, those who are familiar with the life of Paul realize that this is not a complete list of Paul's sufferings. It's not as though he wrote this and then his sufferings were over and he went on to live the rest of his life in ease. Paul actually wrote 2 Corinthians from the standpoint of the book of Acts in about Acts 20 verses 1 and 2. He wrote it from Macedonia. And so all the sufferings that Paul experienced in the book of Acts from chapter 20 verse 3 on through the end of the book could be added to this list. You know, Paul says, for instance, that he's often uh, imprisoned. Well, this list does not include the two years that he was imprisoned in Caesarea and the two years that he was imprisoned in Rome. He mentions here in Acts 11 that three times he suffered shipwreck. Well, this doesn't include the horrendous shipwreck that he experienced in Acts chapter 27. He talks about being in danger among his fellow Jews. Well, this doesn't include the riot that the Jews stirred up in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 21. And so, so Paul suffered a lot more than this list. But these are the things that led Paul to say in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 that outwardly he was wasting away. Yet one passage that I find very interesting is at the conclusion of the book of Galatians. You know, Galatians is very similar to 2 Corinthians in that Paul is being attacked by some uh, false uh, preachers and he's forced to defend himself and defend the true gospel. 
And so he writes at the end of the book of Galatians, chapter 6 and verse 17, this word, From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. You know, we're living in an age where tattoos have become really popular. And so many people have uh, things tattooed on their body with the ink of a tattoo artist. Well, the Apostle Paul had his body marked up, not with the ink of a tattoo artist. Paul did not have, for instance, you know, JC on his bicep. But the Apostle Paul did have on his body the marks that showed that he belonged to Jesus Christ. If you could look at Paul's body without his tunic on, you probably would be shocked at what you see. Because Paul would have on his body scars from all the times that he'd received those uh, 40 lashes minus one from the Jews and all the times that he'd been flogged. Keep in mind that when the Apostle Paul was stoned, he didn't have someone to set the bones after they'd been broken. You know, that's what happens when a person is stoned. The weight of those stones that hit the body again and again break the bones. The Apostle Paul probably had knots all over his body from the bones that were broken. And so truly, he bore in his body the marks of the Lord Jesus because, as he said in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 16, outwardly he was wasting away. But that leads us to our second point. We want to think not just about Paul's outward wasting, but we want to think about Paul's inward strengthening. So notice again verse 16. Paul says, Therefore we do not lose heart. We don't get discouraged. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. You know, usually when a person's uh, outward suffering is up here, a person's uh, inward strength is down here. It's usually the, the case that the more someone suffers physically, the weaker they are emotionally. Because it is such a discouraging thing to suffer physically. But the Apostle Paul made the point that though he was suffering tremendously outwardly and his body was wasting away outwardly, internally, in a spirit, he was becoming stronger. He was being renewed day by day. He wasn't becoming discouraged. He, he wasn't on the verge of giving up. Now understand that Paul is not saying that there were never moments when he would get discouraged. All you have to do is just read through 2 Corinthians to know that that's the case. You consider, for instance, what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 8. He says, We do not want you to, become, uh, to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Paul may be talking about the riot that he lived through in the city of Ephesus that's recorded in the book of Acts in the words here. But at any rate, that was such a serious event, whatever event it is he's referring to in 2 Corinthians 1.8, that he says that he despaired of life itself. Or consider what Paul says his emotional state was when he came into Macedonia just before he wrote 2 Corinthians. He says, for instance, in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning in verse 5, For when we came into Macedonia, we had no rest, but we were harassed at every turn. Conflicts on the outside. So you see, outwardly he was wasting away conflicts on the outside, but notice this. Fears within. But God who comforts the downcast, he says in verse 6, Paul became downcast. But, but even though Paul went through these moments when inwardly he was fearful and inwardly he was downcast and inwardly, inwardly he despaired of life, he was able to say in 2 Corinthians 4.16 that those periods never lasted because in reality he was being renewed day by day. Now, when you read through 2 Corinthians, you see various ways through which he was renewed day by day. Consider, for instance, back in chapter 1, 
Paul says beginning in verse 3, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Now, how was it the case that God comforted Paul? Well, there may be many ways in which God comforted Paul, but, but one way Paul mentions is in the passage we started to read in 2 Corinthians 7. Look at verse 6 of 2 Corinthians 7. But God who comforts the downcast comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort you had given him. And so one way that Paul was comforted when he was down was from his brothers and sisters and the encouragement that they gave him. But what I want us to do is to move to our third point. And I want us to think how Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, that though outwardly he was wasting, inwardly he was being strengthened. What was it, according to Paul in 2 Corinthians 4, that helped him day by day to grow stronger spiritually, though outwardly he was wasting away? What, what helped Paul from giving up when physically he was hurting so badly? Well, if we continue reading in our text at verse 17, we'll see what it was. Paul says, Verse 16, inwardly we're being renewed day by day. Verse 17, 4, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. The reason why Paul was able to grow stronger inwardly, though outwardly he was wasting away, the reason he was able to not give up is because he didn't focus on the outward sufferings. He focused on what those outward sufferings were achieving for him. You see, the Apostle Paul believed that there was a direct connection between his earthly life and his eternal life. In fact, he'll express it this way in chapter 5, which, which is still a part of this passage. Chapter 5 and verse 10, Paul will say, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is done, uh, what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Paul believed that in eternity we'll be rewarded for what we did in this life in our bodies. And the Apostle Paul truly believed that as he suffered for Christ in this life, he would be rewarded in the next life with what he calls, verse 17, an eternal weight of glory that outweighed his sufferings. And so the Apostle Paul fixed his eyes, not on the sufferings that he was enduring, but he fixed his eyes on the eternal weight of glory. He fixed his eyes on the reward that God would give him for his faithful sufferings. And so Paul was able to view those sufferings, verse 17, as light, and momentary troubles. Now think about that. Paul considered the things that we read about in chapter 11 as light and momentary troubles because he was focusing on the reward that God would give him for suffering those things faithfully in heaven. And so, and so just, just imagine, here's the Apostle Paul. He's being stoned in Lystra. Those heavy stones are being pelted against his body. And as those stones are hitting his body, they seem like they would be very heavy. But for Paul, those stones were light. And as those stones were being thrown by the angry mob intending to kill Paul and they only quit because they thought they'd killed Paul, it, it would seem like those stones, those stones would never stop coming. But rather than viewing the stoning as eternal, Paul, Paul viewed the stones as light and he viewed the stones as momentary. Or think about the five times that the Jews laid the 39 lashes on his back. You know, under Jewish law, Deuteronomy 25, Jews were able to um, have someone to be beaten with 40 lashes. But lest they miscount, they would stop at 39. So five times Paul received from the Jews, probably in the synagogue, these 39 lashes in accordance with Jewish law, Deuteronomy 25. 
Think about those lashes. Each lash as it came down on Paul's back, I would think would seem very heavy, heavy, painful lashes. But Paul, because he wasn't focusing on the lashes, he was focusing on the reward he would, see, he would receive in heaven for the lashes. He viewed each lash as light. And I would just think as those lashes were coming down on my back, as the Jews were counting one, two, three, it would seem like they would never reach 39. But for the Apostle Paul, the lashing was momentary because he wasn't focusing on the lashing. He was focusing on the reward that the Lord would give him. And you know, as we think about the glory that we'll receive in the world to come, there certainly is the glory of being in that heavenly place that's described in a passage like Revelation 21 and 22. But the glory that Paul has in mind in 2 Corinthians is the glory of a resurrection body. Let me read for 2 Corinthians 5. And, and, and the reason why I'm preaching this this Sunday is because last Sunday we thought about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's the resurrection of Jesus Christ that makes our own resurrection possible, that will make our own glorified bodies possible. And so consider what Paul says beginning in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1. He says, For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who's given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in this body, we are away from the Lord, for we live by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and to be at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please Him, whether we are at home, in the body, or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. You see, Paul describes three possible states that a child of God could be in. He describes a point in time when, in verse 1, we're at home in this earthly tent. And then he describes another time when we are unclothed. That is, we die. Our spirits are unclothed. Our spirits are not in our bodies. And then he describes another time when we are clothed with our dwelling which is from heaven. And that's talking about the, the glorified resurrection body. You see, Paul says in verses 6 through 8 that while we're in the body, we're away from the Lord. And he has a desire, he says it's better to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. He's talking about the intermediate state after death, between death and resurrection, when our spirits are away from our bodies, but our spirits are with the Lord. But the best condition yet is to have this heavenly dwelling, this glorified resurrection body, and to be with the Lord. And that's the condition that we'll all be in when Jesus Christ comes again. And so here's the thing, if we'll be like Paul, and even though our bodies are wearing out, even though outwardly we're getting weaker and weaker, even though on a daily basis we're experiencing more and more pain, even when we look in the mirror, we don't have the beauty that we had in youth. If we will keep our eyes fixed, not on the sufferings of the here and the now, but if we keep our eyes fixed on the reward that He will give us, if we will, because of that focus, view our sufferings not as burdensome, but as light and as momentary and will be faithful and we won't give up, then the time will come at Jesus' coming when we'll receive this glorified body from heaven. And in this glorified body from heaven, we'll receive a glory that far outweighs any of the sufferings that we experienced. I love the way that Jesus described our
condition in heaven in Matthew chapter 13 and at verse 43. He said, Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Isn't that a great thought? The time's coming when, ladies, you won't need makeup anymore. You won't need a hairdresser. You know, guys, you won't have to worry because, um, you know, hair's falling out or hair's becoming gray or more wrinkles are coming up or, or whatever. We'll all shine like the sun because of that eternal weight of glory that God will give us in our resurrection bodies. And so let's all remain faithful to the end. Let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you so much for the wonderful power of the gospel the power that's made possible through Jesus' resurrection, that the time's coming when if we will faithfully endure the burdens of this life, you'll give us in our resurrection bodies a glory that far exceeds them all. Lord, we're weak. We all have the tendency to become weaker spiritually as we become weaker physically. But Lord, help us, though our outward bodies are wasting away Help us to become stronger spiritually day by day. Bless us all with the grace that we need to be faithful to you in this life. Forgive us. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. We thank you for taking the time to worship with us and to study a portion of God's Word. We pray that this has been an edifying experience and that you would join us again. Now, if at any point during the lesson you had some questions, please feel free to email us at mhysol at metaview.org. The email is both on the screen and in the description below. It is our goal to answer every Bible question with a Bible answer, to speak where the Bible speaks, and to be silent where it is silent. God bless you. We love you.